by event so that you can access it in the future and we can share with those that could not join us. Uh, all participants are, are muted and your video will be disabled for the duration of the program. Uh, if you just joined, please note that the audio can take a couple of minutes to connect. A reminder that you are encouraged to join via the WebEx app. If you've joined via WebEx browser, you may be able, or excuse me, you may be unable to hear and see a brief one minute intro video that we will play momentarily. You should be able to see and hear all other presentation content. When we begin the Q&A portion of the program following Dr. Lofgren's presentation, you're encouraged to type and send questions in the chat box. We will do our very best to answer as many questions as possible. If you need more help tech troubleshooting, please reach out to Lori McDermott. Her contact information is in your confirmation email. We'll now begin the program with a brief video message from the Executive Director of the Alumni Association, Jen Heisey. I'm now pleased to introduce our moderator, Dr. Kurt, Dr. Christopher Lewis, UC's Vice Provost for Academic Programs. Chris, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Russell, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to uh, be a part of this program, uh, particularly since it features one of my favorite men in the whole planet, Dr. Rick Lofgren. For those of you who don't know him very well yet, you certainly will by the end of today. Dr. Richard Lofgren is, a, is President and CEO of UC Health, the University of Cincinnati's affiliated health system, and the region's only academic health system. UC Health, with more than 11,000 employees, physicians, and advanced practice providers, comprises the University of Cincinnati Medical Center that we affectionately refer to as UCMC, Westchester Hospital, the Daniel Drake Center for Post-Acute Care, the Lindner Center of Hope, and more than 30 outpatient service locations in three states. I'm fortunate enough to be able to uh, practice out of one of those locations, the Burnett uh, Avenue uh, practice uh, with the primary care network. Dr. Lofgren is a board-certified internal medicine physician and administrator with nearly 40 years of experience in healthcare. He has a particular interest in uh, healthcare delivery redesign, operational efficiencies, performance improvement, and applied health services and quality research. Interestingly for today's topic, he also holds a master's degree in epidemiology. You really are a smart guy, aren't you, sir? <laughs> he received his undergraduate and medical degrees from the University of Michigan. I'm certainly someone on the line may want to give a good go blue, but we don't do that uh, when you when you're wearing the next lives here badge on your on your jacket. You don't do that. Uh, and he's also uh, completed his residency and chief residency at the University of Minnesota and received his Master of Public Health from the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. He serves on a plethora of regional and state boards, including the Ohio Hospital Administration, the Greater Cincinnati Urban League, and the Cincinnati USA Regional Chamber, among others. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Lofgren has also been tapped to be a healthcare advisor to Ohio Governor Mike DeWine and has led and continues to lead our regional response for all healthcare organizations. Most important thing that I can tell you today about Dr. Lofgren is he is a man who uh, speaks his, his mind and lives up to his word. When he came to town, he, uh, he offered a new tagline for UC Health uh, to advance suffering and reduce, uh, to, sorry, to advance healing and reduce suffering. And to me, what that says is, you know, a lot of healthcare administrators 
uh, are very interested, obviously, in the bottom line. They're, they're also very interested in taking good care of people. But the humanistic approach with which Dr. Lofgren uh, uh, does his job, his evidence in that last part of that phrase, reduce suffering. And a lot of people, particularly doctors like myself, we don't always like to think and be guided by that suffering, but it is, it, it is a real thing. And for Dr. Lofgren to acknowledge that and make it part of his tagline, I think, speaks volumes about who he is, not just as an administrator, but also as a person. Ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Lofgren. Thank you. I unmuted. Oh, there I am unmuted. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lewis, thank you for that, that wonderful and generous uh, introduction. Uh, it really is a, a pleasure and uh, to be with you. And I really do appreciate having the opportunity to speak to the UC alumni. Uh, really is uh, very special. Uh, Dr. Lewis did mention that um, I was a graduate of the University of Michigan, which makes me a very easy convert to being a huge Bearcat fan um, and really have really loved my time here in Cincinnati. Uh, what I do think we'll spend some time talking about and just to introduce um, having some trouble moving my slides, there we go. Um, just to introduce UC Health, as you said, you know, one of the things I think is important um, is we all understand oftentimes the mission, but uh, really what we speak to in terms of people working at UC Health is really understanding why we get up in the morning and we do what we do. And really the importance of wherever we sit in the organization, we can advance healing. And regardless of the circumstances, we can really, you know, really affect the human uh, events and human suffering. Our vision is to be that academic, premier academic referral system that really cares for people with the most challenging and complex issues, the issues that kind of, that require truly the kind of expertise you only find in an academic center where you have the whole plethora of expertise from uh, technical as well as knowledge. And I think that the importance of that whole team of experts really has never been more evident than what we've done in terms of the UC and the UC family in addressing the pandemic that has afflicted us in sort of a once in a lifetime thing. The other thing that I wanted to, to show and display here is our, our values because they really do guide what we do every day. And it does start in fact with patients and families first, making sure that our decisions and things we do are really gonna affect and improve the quality of the individuals that we care for and entrust us. And speaking to then about the pandemic, um, you know, it's one of these things that it, I heard somebody earlier in, in this describe the fact that being unprecedented doesn't really begin to describe the disruption that we've all felt and seen as a result of this uh, infection. What you have depicted here is simply the number of cases worldwide. There's over 33 million people have been affected. In the United States, it's north of uh, 7 million. Unfortunately, we've had more than 200,000 deaths in the United States related to this infection. Locally in Cincinnati, we've had almost 30,000 individuals who've been affected by this disease. Looking more closely at Ohio, what you see here um, is in fact what's happening across the state. We've had over 150,000 cases. Um, Again, that's as the virus spread. It's also as we actually improved our ability to detect the virus in the, in the community. And so one of the things that I know that I look at in terms of really the activity and the burden and the disease is really how many patients not only are infected, but are infected to the point that requires them to be hospitalized. And what you see there, we've had over 15,000 hospitalizations in around Ohio. And early on, you see, and we'll come spend some time, you see the, the introduction of the virus into our community in the beginning part of, of April. Actually, with a lot of good work, we've actually caught, allowed the number of hospitalizations to decline. And then, um, and I'll talk a minute in a moment, then as particularly some of the social events in terms of bars and social events occurred in the early part of June, we saw another uptick in hospitalizations. And please report that that is, continues actually to trend down. Unfortunately, um, almost 5,000 individuals in, uh, in the Ohio have lost or have succumbed to the, this virus. So it has had a real impact. 
When you look more regionally here, for those in the greater Cincinnati area, you know, what we depict here is something that's called the R naught, um, something that, you know, only epidemiologists used to talk about, and now you hear about on the, on the radio all the time kind of thing. But it is a measure, if you will, about how many individuals one person who's infected will infect in return. So if the R value, if you will, is greater than one, that means one person is infecting more than one person and the virus is spreading in the community. If you can keep that spread below one, meaning that an affected person on average doesn't affect another individual, um, it says that the virus is, under, is more under control and, and suppressed. As you can see here, the most recent data in the Ohio area, in the uh, um, Hamilton County, really puts that value at 0.83. What's depicted here, as you can see the dotted line in the top upper left-hand corner, is really that cut point of one. And you can see early on it was as high as two and a half uh, individuals. So when the virus was first introduced into our community, for every individual that's infected, they would turn around and infect two and a half, as many on average, two and a half other individuals, really leading to the spread. But what we saw was pretty quickly with all the measures that we took, that got very suppressed. We had some up and downs. And you see in the latter part, if you follow up in just uh, the latter part of July, uh, June, if you will, we actually saw it come back up and now we're seeing down. Beneath it is the incidence. Well, so you see that bar graph going up and down. And one of the things that is true is that with time, we actually had more tests available. And if you test more, you're gonna detect the virus more frequently. Uh, but so that's where you see this big uptick in, in there in July. But in addition to that uptick in terms of cases, we also saw more hospitalizations and we saw more ICU cases. So not only was it a factor that we were actually having more tests and people are being detected, even asymptomatic, but we were also having people that were actually catching, uh, uh, contracting the virus and actually having some serious complications as well. Got a little bit more detail of that and just really look at what happened. So again, looking at the upper left-hand corner and the sort of spread of the community, um, really saw that the as the virus was being infected, uh, introduced in the community, the spread was pretty rapid. We suppressed it. Um, and even as we opened up the health systems in May, which is some of the red lines you see in the left lower corner, and even as we started opening up restaurants, we were really able to keep the virus spread under control. Um, but what we did see in the latter part of, of June is we really started to see an uptick, and we really saw it particularly in individuals between the ages of 20 and 30. Um, as more social events were occurring, as the bars were opening up, we really did see a, a pretty, dramatic, pretty significant uptick in people becoming infected in that age group. Unfortunately, that translated, if you will, into more infections in older adults. The other thing then you see is that uptick in cases occurred in the early part of Ju uh, July, we really saw the impact of, of really being serious about masking and controlling the infection. Um, and what you saw is that the infection rate did decline very nicely as we move along with that with time as well. So uh, again, I think this demonstrates, um, and we'll show this over and over again, is that the measures of keeping the community safe really are effective. Um, we've learned a lot about this virus along the way. And one of the things that we understand is that we cannot eradicate the virus at this point in time. Lord knows we can't hide from it forever, but we actually can learn how to live with that virus and keep it under bay, under bay so that it doesn't adversely affect us and still try to open up both our economy and our lives as we move forward. So what you see here more recently is then, um, it's a complicated slide, I apologize for that, but it's the various uh, positivity rate we see, if you will, uh, in various age groups. So if you look in the lower right-hand corner, people between the ages of 20 and 29, you can see the little dots and then you see the bar and it says it's 2.4%. And what that means is that right now, when we test somebody in that age group, about 2.4% of them come back positive. What you see in the upper right-hand corner in the ages of 18 to 24 and the latter part of August, 
you see in that age group a rather dramatic increase in the positivity rate. And this is clearly related to particularly colleges coming back where we saw a big uptick in this age group, um, if you will. Um, Dr. Lewis has been on the point for really leading the charge in protecting the students at the University of Cincinnati. I can tell you that they, what the work that they have done has really been exemplar uh, in terms of how they've managed both the uh, students living in the dorms, how they manage the, um, the uh, community at large, and really have done a, a really, I think, a remarkable job of really minimizing the spread within uh, that age group. So I'm gonna walk you through this slide because I do think it sort of tells an important story about the spread. So if you go back and what you see with each dot is a day, and what's depicted here are the number of people who are hospitalized with COVID in the greater Cincinnati region. And what you see that, again, going back to April, as the virus was introduced into our community, we saw an uptick in terms of patients, people hospitalized with COVID, really at a peak in the middle part of April of about 180 patients at any given point in time. Then you see the effectiveness of the measures that we took to prevent the spread, and we saw a really steady decline in terms of, of uh, hospitalizations in the early part of, 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 of June to mid-June. And then I mentioned again that what we saw in mid-June is really an uptick in spread, particularly between 20 and 30-year-olds. What we did then see following that is what is becoming in some places across the country kind of an echo that you see it in one group and then you see it in a more vulnerable group, then you see hospitalizations, then you see ICU care, and then unfortunately you see an uptick in deaths. So what, you, what we saw here is like two weeks later, we saw a dramatic increase in the number of individuals in the greater Cincinnati uh, region who are hospitalized with COVID. And in fact, the number of people who were seriously affected by the virus in the early part of July exceeded what it was when the virus was first introduced in April. Then you saw measures that were taken. We saw a drop, kind of bounced up and down. But if you noticed, really since the time of August, we've had a, fairly, a very steady decline in the number of people in the region hospitalized with, uh, with COVID-19. And of note, we saw this uptick in the college age students but this to date has not translated into a secondary uh, form of infection to older adults that ultimately has been leading to hospitalizations. So again, I think the measures that we've taken seem to really have not uh, adversely affected the spread within the greater community. And what I can tell you both in, in the greater Cincinnati region as well as Ohio is that we're seeing this sort of steady decline in hospitalizations and even the positivity rate, the number of individuals tested who are positive, we've seen drift from about 5% to the low 3%. So that really has been good news along the way. One of the other things I thought I would share with you is really what Ohio has done in response to this. And uh, I can tell you that I think one of the things that Ohio was a leader in was sort of organizing the response. And so the governor used the emergency preparedness regions, which you can see here of the, of the eight regions, but then went on to say, you know, we need to have a coordination into three zones organized around the three C's of Cincinnati, Columbus, and uh, Cleveland to make sure that first and foremost, that there's a standard across the entire Ohio, that there's uniform access to high quality care, that we really are uh, sending the right message. And to anchor each one of those um, zones, they called upon the academic health system connected with medical schools to really take the lead. So the lead in Cleveland is the Cleveland Clinic. In the uh, Columbus area is the Ohio State. And here in the, our zone in region six and three, it's really the us at the University of Cincinnati, recognizing that the expertise that resides within our academic centers really needs to be at the, at the forefront of helping guiding what we're doing in response to this pandemic. The other thing I would just mention in our zone that I think has been very important um, is that first, we've come together as a health system. Early on when we were trying to prepare for the possible surge and to avoid what happened in Italy or New York, 
all the health systems came together and really agreed that we're no longer competitors, but collaborators, making sure that we were prepared. But in addition, as the pandemic went on and we controlled that initial surge, we realized that we needed to figure out and avoid hot spots. And the hot spots really are those places where there's congregate living, particularly amongst high risk individuals, most notably nursing homes. At the same time, we needed to figure out how we support our local health departments to improve testing as well as identifying cases to keep the virus under control. And so we've organized on a, on a regional basis all of the healthcare systems, congregate living, and health departments that meet to really address the issues of hotspots, testing, and controlling the virus. This group actually meets three times a week to really share best practices and make sure that we are responding to the needs of the region. So going on to the virus itself, obviously, and many of you have read a whole host. This is obviously the, the issue here is that it's a highly contagious virus that's novel, meaning that nobody in the, had been affected in the human race. So at some level, all of us were at risk of, of acquiring the infection. It's a respiratory illness, uh, like a lot of other um, uh, coronaviruses uh, that causes even things like common colds. Therefore, it's spread from person to person, most notably from little spitlet or respiratory droplets um, from an infected person. You can also become infected if you uh, touch a contaminated surface or touch the hands of somebody and then touch your, your, your face. It's really how it spreads, with the most important element of spread really coming from the respiratory droplets. And listed here, as you can see, are really the symptoms. And the cornerstone of the symptoms are fevers, cough, and shortness of breath. A host of those symptoms have, as we've learned more about the disease, really have been associated. One that I will tell you that's really quite unique to the COVID infection is this loss of taste and smell, uh, which has become increasingly more specific, uh, unique but specific symptom of COVID. So one of the things I do like to say is that over the last six months, we have learned a lot and we will continue to learn a lot. You know, I think back about what we thought and understood about this virus six months ago versus our understanding now is really dramatically different. I sort of tongue in cheek, you know, say six months ago, we thought 100% of the people who were infected with COVID-19 had a fever and that the virus couldn't affect children. Well, six months later, we know that neither one of those statements are true as we really have come to understand the whole spectrum of this disease and, and really the unique element that is triggering this bizarre, intense inflammatory response in a handful of individuals. We've learned a lot about treatment, and obviously the big issue is that for us to eradicate the disease in our community is really a, a ultimately is developing an effective vaccine, which we've really been at the forefront of you here at UC. Just to touch upon testing, this is an area I think of great confusion. Um, one of the cornerstones of testing is called the PCR test. It is detects when you are actively infected. It's highly sensitive and it's highly specific. It's not very many false positive. And what it does is it's able to, to detect even low concentrations of virus um, that really detects that you're actively infected. One of the things that has been is that it's so uh, effective that um, Patients who are no longer contagious actually can shed fragments of the virus that we can still detect weeks later, um, which has led to some confusion about whether or not somebody has been reaffected or not. Um, it takes about two to six hours. It is the cornerstone of the testing we do at UC Health. The other test that you know may have heard about is the antigen test, which is a very quick blood test um, and obviously caused quite a stir when Governor DeWine tested positive. But one of the issues that with the, the antigen test is that um, it does detect active disease, but it, it has a, a relatively high rate of false negatives um, and also a high, relatively high number of false positives. It's fast. It can be done uh, at a point of service and in, in, even in an office, and it's less than, than um, the PCR test. How it's going to be used in terms of mass screening um, is uh, still being developed. But clearly, people who test positive need to have a confirmatory test to know, just like the governor did, where his first test was positive on the antigen, but his PCR test was negative, and he was not infected with COVID-19. The other test is antibodies, and this is really a, a measure of whether or not you have had an infection. And the, and the key question is, does that mean you're protected from becoming infected again? 
And though there's some debate about that, there's still the, the, the belief that, by and large, people who have the presence of antibodies, at least for a period of time, are protected. One of the problems in the antibody testing, though, is it can have some false positives that it can detect or antibodies that are similar to COVID-19 from previous infections you might have, like a cold. So that we really recommend that you have to have a confirmatory second test to really make sure that it's accurate. And this is the mechanism that we're doing for lab testing, for antibody testing as we move forward. Again, it's one that really allows you to understand whether or not you've been previously infected, where the PCR tells you that you've been actively infected. So if you look at then the, the value of this, the PCR test is highly accurate um, um, uh, and fairly quick. The, The antigen test is, is fast uh, and low cost, and the antibody test is relatively low cost, uh, but uh, suffer both of those suffer from problems with accuracy in terms of overall testing strategies. One of the things that you see uh, the College of Medicine and some of the leaders, particularly out of the Department of Emergency Medicine, working with the Health Collaborative, is entered into a program with Hamilton County to really test and, and protect. It's really built upon uh, a model that uh, the leadership here at the University of Cincinnati developed in terms of testing and educating people with HIV disease. We're now taking that knowledge and applying it to COVID. And so it's an ability to identify hot spots, areas where the disease seems to be more prevalent and sp spreading, really identify uh, individuals and populations that may be a particular risk for infections or complications. It really then goes out, does the testing, develops tools to make sure we can act, and really does um, some education as well as uh, informing uh, the health departments about what's the best way to contain the spread so that we can, again, live with the virus in the community as we work to eradicate it. The treatment for, for COVID-19 is also involved. Um, we've, we've come to learn that people who've recovered who have antibodies what we call convalescent plasma with these antibodies, if we give them to individuals, particularly earlier in the course of the disease, it really does appear to many patients improve the outcome. It really does seem to have a clear benefit. We've seen some antivirals, remdesivir being the, the ones that really does have, a, again, uh, somewhat limited but clear benefit to some patients. Again, recognizing as we learn more about it that Earlier, the, in, earlier in the course of the disease seems to have a, a, a much bigger impact. Initially, we were only giving it to people late in the course of the disease and didn't have nearly as big an impact. There's a number of other cell-based therapies, a number of other treatments that are looking at, at the virus and how it works. One of the things that we have learned is new devices, how to provide oxygenation. So one of the things that is unique about this virus is that most individuals, when they become short of breath and their oxygen levels become low, um, they become short of breath. One of the things that's unique about um, the COVID infections is that people with blood uh, oxygen levels would drop to very dangerous levels, and they wouldn't really complain of being short of breath. Um, being not having enough blood oxygen in your blood is called hypoxia, and there's this sort of term called happy hypoxia, meaning people were very hypoxic but weren't aware of it. And unfortunately, early in the, in the pandemic, places like New York were finding that people were arriving at the emergency departments way late um, and that really beyond being able to be treated. So that now we understand that if you have the disease and starting to have any, any respiratory symptoms, we send you home with a little device called a pulse oximeter so you can early detect whether or not your oxygen levels are, are, are dropping and we can intervene. And this has made a huge difference. I might also say that the two other things that we've learned is that this virus can cause tremendous inflammation and clotting of the blood and complications that I think will actually have lingering problems as we learn more. We've also come to realize that it really is this inflammation that causes problems so that steroids really have made a huge difference and we've really made great improvements along the way. And that really gets to the issue about discovery. And I can tell you that the expertise here at the University of Cincinnati really has been leading the way in terms of really understanding what we can do here and now, as well as um, the entire impact of this pandemic. So early on, the, the leadership has been involved in um, 
convalescent studies. We are part of the Mayo, National Mayo, Mayo Trial about using the, the convalescent antibodies to treat individuals. We've been testing a whole host of, of antivirals um, and have a, a number of uh, clinical trials that are open. We've been systematically collecting specimens from individuals infected with COVID-19 and uh, uh, freezing their specimens so that scientists can um, look at those specimens and really um, uh, do other basic science studies to really have a better understanding about the virus and how we can ultimately and effectively manage it and treat it. There are studies going on about looking at the, the impact of stress and well-being and the mental health taste that it's have on all of us, both who have suffered and frankly have suffered from the, the really the social impact of this pandemic. We're doing a number of, of epidemiologic studies and of course been very much involved in the key vaccine trials. Which really gets back to um, really a, an important role and a real testament to the quality of the science that is here at UC. Uh, we've been selected as one of 89 sites across the country to be in the final phase of testing the effectiveness of one of the leading vaccines by the company Madeira um, in terms of uh, enrolling, they want to enroll about 30,000 individuals around the country and, and we are responsible in enrolling 500. The group that's really been leaving it from the government standpoint has been uh, Operation Warp Speed, really looking and galvanizing and partnering the government with the scientific community and the pharmaceutical community to really um, to quickly develop a, a very effective, safe vaccine as we move forward. They were recently in town last week really to recognize what an outstanding job that the University of Cincinnati has done in enrolling minority, in particular African Americans, into these trials. One of the problems and shortcomings with trials is that the, the number of in types of individuals from various demographic groups can be too limited. And so there's always a question about whether or not the vaccine, once approved, really has the same effectiveness in various uh, populations and, and various groups. And so we really have been at the lead of really recruiting minorities into our trial here, which again speaks to the, the quality of the research here and the, and the connection with our community. And so the final thing I really want to touch on before we do open it up to questions um, is really the issues around the vaccine. Um, we do see that there are probably two or three candidates that are in the final phases of looking at the phase three trials, the kind of things that look at the efficacy and safety of the trial in large groups. Um, the two leading candidates, including the Madeira vaccine, one of the challenges when we start to think about implementing it is that these vaccines will require two doses. And then there's the whole logistical issue about well, how do we make sure that we track individuals who have gotten the first dose, making sure they get the second dose as well? The other challenge is that the first two um, vaccines that appear to be, will be coming to the market first, at this point in time, appear to be need to be kept super cold at, at the super freezing level or at a minus 70. You know, these super refrigerators are actually relatively rare and quite honestly, typically are only found in, in places like research centers. Um, and so identifying places where we're going to be able to store the vaccine once it becomes available is one of the logistical issues that we're working with the state and collaboration across the entire state of Ohio to identify places that have these kind of super refrigerations and also how we're going to maintain and keep the, 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 vir uh, the vaccine in that state before it's thawed and distributed. So that we're looking at how we do the distribution across the state Recognizing that, you know, likely the first tranche of a vaccine may be as many as 10 million. Um, but if you, if you spread that around the country, that's really a small fraction of individuals that will be able to be vaccinated in the first uh, wave of, of when the vaccine becomes available. So really understanding where's the greatest priority, where will have its greatest impact among health care workers, as well as particular, um, um, vulnerable populations. And finally, the other real concern about the implementation is really sort of the public concerns that there is not only people who have a small fraction of the community that really has concerns about vaccines in general, but also because of other uh, publicity and everything else that's happened that's raised some concerns because it's been developed so quickly 
is making sure that we understand that it's safe and effective. And so making sure that the, the healthcare community is at the forefront of reassuring uh, that the vaccines are safe and effective, and then therefore by reassuring the community. And as I <clears throat> want to just remind you, and one of the concerns is that we're about to enter flu season, another respiratory infection. And as you know, or I may, may be aware, is that the common flu is actually causes a, a, a serious number of infections, hospitalizations, and death. So in 2019, we saw 35 million Americans being affected. There are almost 500,000 individuals that got hospitalized, and nearly and over 34,000 individuals actually died as a result of that as we move forward <clears throat> from that infection. Now, the flu season varies from, from year to year. Um, the flu vaccine, in terms of it, the, vac the virus itself, morphs and changes. So each year we need to modify the vaccine and and it's always kind of a guess about whether or not it's really effective in, 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 in mitigating the infection. Um, but it clearly has an impact even when it's not a perfect match. So uh, I beseech you to make sure that you don't forget your flu shot. But what I will tell you is I do, we do have some, I think, interesting news about the flu. So typically, when we think about what kind of flu season we're headed into the, in the United States, we look at what the experience has been in, in the Southern Hemisphere. So right now, in the Southern Hemisphere, they're sort of the peak winter and the peak of their influenza season. And what I'm showing you here is the results of hospitalizations from the flu in Australia. And they have the various colors here. For example, the big peak bell was 2017, a particularly harsh season. And you can see the various uptick in terms of hospitalizations. And then at the very bottom, you can see that the red line about the number of hospitalizations they've had um, this season, which has been very minimal. So it really does appear that, A, the vaccine appears to be a good match, but also all the measures that we are taking to prevent the spread of COVID also has had an impact of limiting the spread of influenza as well. So I certainly hope that this uh, suggests that, we'll, that maybe this will not be as harsh as we had, had hoped and feared. Which leads to me really with my last message is that we know a lot more than we did. And we do know that we can limit the spread of this virus in our community. And it really just involves a handful of simple measures. Social distancing, washing your hands, cleaning off surfaces, and most importantly, when you're out in public, when you're in, in, in other uh, settings, wearing a mask. You know, one of the things that has surprised me during this in terms of understanding is that I knew that a mask was was effective in preventing you from spreading the virus, but I don't think I really appreciate how effective this technique was going to be in terms of really limiting the spread. So with that, I will stop and uh, I'll turn it over to the moderator to see if they some questions that people may have. And again, I want to thank you for the, having the opportunity to to, to meet with you and speak with you today. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Lofgren. It has been a true treat to hear from a leading health expert in our state about uh, the coronavirus pandemic. I see that the questions are starting to pile in, so I'm going to do my best to keep up. We had a question from Daniel Sammons about the J&J &J, uh, trial. Johnson & Johnson working on a single-dose vaccine, and, and temps have been reported as high, meaning fevers. I wanted to know if you had any positives on this front. I, I, I don't know how familiar you may be, so I sent him some information from CNN that 99% of the participants in the 18 to 55 age group uh, received uh, the, the, the um, vaccine and uh, developed antibodies against the virus 29 days after getting vaccinated, and that one of the most common side effects is fever. But if, you're, if you have any other information about the J&J &J, uh, uh, trial, we're, we're all ears. Yeah, well, you know, you, you... Um, these are fast moving and you, and you, I think you've, you summarized it very nicely. One of the things that probably is worthwhile noting, I think there's in excess of 90 different sort of vaccines in development. And so there are a whole host of vaccines that are, are out there. Some that are, require a single dose. Um, some actually try to evoke different kind of antibiotic responses in terms of what antibodies they generate. So obviously the first thing is to find an effective vaccine. I do think we're gonna see a number of vaccines come uh, forward and we're gonna have a lot uh, of learnings along the way of which one's most effective. 
perhaps we actually might need a combination of vaccines as we move forward. Um, so it is such a rapidly uh, expanding field. Uh, I can tell you that I am in awe about the science that is happening in terms of what people are doing in terms of developing these vaccines. But the first phase is to get some of these vaccines out there that have an effectiveness. But I tell you that part of the conversation is as the other vaccines come to market, understanding which ones work, maybe they work more effectively in different groups, maybe they work differently even in combination. So there'll be much to learn about this. Yeah, I certainly agree. And uh, to see how successful UC has been at recruiting um, uh, subjects of color is just amazing. And I know that we're getting national attention for that. And it's nice to know that that effort dovetails with uh, with our university strategic direction, Nexus here, uh, particularly the urban health and the inclusive excellence platforms of Nexus here. So you all are li living and breathing the mission. On the topic of vaccines, uh, Linda Huntress wants to know, uh, once vaccines become available, is it likely that a person will have a chance to get more than one vaccine as, as more effective ones become available? I know you touched briefly on that, but what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think there's a lot to know and sort of be a little bit of speculation about that. Uh, I think that, you know, first is getting some vaccines out and the logistics around that. You know, the idea of, of getting 100 million vaccines out is going to be the issue. I think there's still a debate about how long, the, how effective the an antibody response will be and how long does it last. You know, is this like the measles and it's good for a long period of time, or is this going to be something where the virus changes enough that we actually might need to be vaccinated or revaccinated along the way? Your question about then what's going to be the most effective and what the combination will be is something that we're going to have to explore. Because um, sometimes when you revaccinate, re as you know, you can actually have evoke a response and actually get more of an adverse re reaction. Sometimes the secondary boost actually helps you. So um, more to understand, more work for our clinical trialists as they start to understand what's most effective. There is a question in the queue about whether or not this presentation will be available later. The answer is yes, and I'll let Russell, Russell as he closes this out, uh, give people instructions on where to access and, and how. Uh, another question, uh, can you briefly explain when it is determined to use the rapid test versus the PCR test? And this person particularly wanted to know, is UC's campus offering students both options? The answer to the UC portion of it is yes, we are doing the rapid test in symptomatic patients. And if they test negative, we are then doing a confirmatory PCR test to make sure that we uh, really drill down and don't miss anybody. But the, the part for you to address, Dr. Lofgren, can you briefly explain when it is determined to use the rapid versus the PCR? Yeah, I think that, again, um, the, P, the rapid test is really useful when you're going to screen. Um, and as, as Dr. Lewis said, if you're going to really screen a symptomatic person, it gives you, and they come back positive, they can act on it. If, you know, in terms of confirmatory tests. So it really is in those screening environments where the rapid test is most useful. Let me give an example where I think that rapid test is being deployed right now is in the congregate living and nursing homes where they are testing the, the residents and the, and the workers there uh, as often as two times a week. And so that it really gets them an, an ability to quickly go through um, and if there's a concern, they really need to confirm it. They do a the PCR is still the gold standard at this point in time. Um, but how we can get more effective in um, in testing large groups and screening is where I think you're going to see the rapid test. I might also say that just as we're talking about vaccines, I can tell you there's a lot of interesting science going on and trying to develop quicker, faster, more accurate tests as well. So I think you're going to start to see some of that emerge as well. Cannot wait for that. Exactly. Uh, we have a question from the audience. What are your thoughts about having community pharmacists provide the COVID vaccine to patients? You know, I think there are two things about the, the ultimately the distribution is going to be have to include the community health departments as well as things like uh, your local pharmacist and the like. I think there are two elements that we really need to work through initially. One is maintaining the super cold. Now, what to be fair, um, I know that many of the pharmaceutical companies have kept them at super temperatures just to protect the vaccine and have not really done a tolerance test. In other words, is it still effective if you keep it at minus 20? So they're still learning that. 
So once we actually understand sort of how we can do the distribution, I think that we will have wide distribution because otherwise we're not going to get to a wide public. And in terms of people getting it, we will see some prioritization uh, as it comes out, healthcare workers, um, followed by probably vulnerable populations. But ultimately, to really get herd immunity, we have to have widespread uh, uptake of the virus, in which case we can potentially even not only suppress the spread of this virus, but even potentially eradicate it. Amen to that. Uh, a question from the queue, is there still an opportunity to sign up for the Moderna and the UC UC Health vaccine trial? The answer to that is yes. And uh, one of our uh, UC Health uh, folks just sent the link out uh, for people that want more information on the trial. Another question that we have, how are you incorporating antibody testing into your screening strategies? If a quantitative antibody test were available with high sensitivity and specificity, would that change your strategy at all? You know, I, I think that the, the – so right now we are focusing on detecting cases, and we're putting our energy really around making sure we have wide availability of PCR testing and accurate testing in the community, both at UC Health and actually working with even some of the commercial labs as well. I think really having a, a rapid, accurate antibody testing may in fact inform us of uh, who needs to be vaccinated, how this the spread, and so it will uh, impact our strategy about how to do the testing. Um, but I don't think that the antibody testing at this point in time is there. Uh, but again, I, I want to make sure that I, I say that it's a rapidly changing uh, environment. One of the things I tell my colleagues, and I think we don't do enough to the community, is that, you know, well, that's not what you said three three months ago. Well, three months ago, I didn't have nearly understanding what I have today. And I guarantee you some of what I said today will change three months from now. Um, and it really speaks to the really uh, the nearly miraculous kind of response you're seeing from the scientific community, not the least of which is UC. And for the alumni on the line, that is important as well as we try to do our best to protect the health and safety of everybody on campus. We've had uh, to implement a variety of strategies and, and have to have a fluid approach because the information coming out changes, it almost seems like, on a daily basis. So, you know, being able to work with a team that's, uh, that's very skilled in being nimble and fluid and, and data-driven has been hugely uh, uh, a, a part of our success. Uh, you know, when you, when, if you would have asked me before the term started, whether or not we were going to make it to the sixth week. <laughs> I probably would have uh, given a little chuckle like I just did, and, and I wouldn't have been so optimistic. But here we are in week six, taking it day by day. But again, the, the, to, in testament to the leadership of Dr. Lofgren, of President Pinto, and, and all the other leadership members on really uh, getting this right and also being willing to, to shift and pivot when necessary. Dr. Lofgren, question for you. When do you think we are going to return to normal life? as we knew it before. Do you think that's in the cards? Will we ever be able to attend a concert again? You know, in the six plus months I've been involved, there's been not a question that I've been, it's not a time when I haven't been asked that question in which I usually, do, you know, drop back 15 and punt. Um, so, um, you know, I think that the, the issue really will be when we have widespread uh, uptake of the vaccine, and, you know, the timeline um, of, of the summer of 21, I think, is, is doable. Uh, be aggressive, but it's doable. Um, but that's really, a, you know, people are talking the summer to the fall um, in terms of that seems to make a, a reasonable timeline. I do think that it's going to raise the issue, though, is that some of the measures in terms of masking when you're sick, staying home when you're sick, and really think about how we prevent the spread of respiratory illnesses, including the flu, I, I'm hoping will become a little bit more standard way in which we sort of conduct ourselves uh, moving forward. Yeah, I know that Bearcats, you know, folks that graduated from UC didn't have that go-getter mentality, and even if they're sick, they want to go to work. And, and get the work done, and uh, things have to change. And that behavioral modification, I agree with you, Dr. Lawson. It's going to be key to our success. You spoke about maybe summer, fall, and certainly we, uh, you know, I understand your, your desire to punt on that one. Uh, how about a question that's a little bit less distant? Uh, what about the holidays? Rapidly approaching, what precautions should people take if they intend to try to have any sorts of celebrations or gatherings with family? 
Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And, and I think that, you know, really um, understanding sort of, quote, who's in your bubble. You know, one of the things this is really in some respects, and now the epidemiologist is speaking here, it's really about the math. You know, in the end, it's about probability of the math. Um, that if if you walk around about 1% of the, of the population is infected, that means quite honestly, mathematically, 99% of the people you run into is fine. But the more people you walk into, the higher the probability that you're going to do it. So as you start to get, that's why social events become really problematic in terms of where we're seeing. If you go to the hot spots that are happening, they're happening at nursing homes, um, you know, showers and, and, and social events, and at the bars. And it's when you really are in a tight quarter with poor ventilation, without mask, speaking directly where the, within a period of time. As you start to think about the holiday, then it's really about thinking about your bubble in terms of how many people you're going to, you know, bring in to that and really what they've done in terms of making sure they're safe. Um, some individuals, which I don't think is unreasonable, is actually if they are uncertain, particularly going to be with a high risk, you know, a grandmother or an elderly person who is particularly at high risk. Some people are actually in, in getting screening and making sure they're being tested before it to make sure that they're asymptomatic. So it really is about the wisdom of understanding the bubble and maintaining those measures, um, recognizing that if there's any doubt, social distancing, masking, and washing your hands works. Dr. Lofgren, uh, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about our global society and whether we can expect more issues like this as we become a smaller world. You uh, have been very involved with the work of Village Life Outreach Project, which is a nonprofit that I started in partnership with UC and UC Health many, many years ago. We, we provide service and health care to people in Tanzania, East Africa, one of the poorest countries on the world. We were featured in the you know, on the cover of UC Magazine a couple of issues ago. Uh, but knowing that you have a, you know, a bent towards global citizenship and caring about not just our immediate community, but, you know, the, the health and well-being of the entire world, what are your thoughts there about the future of pandemics? Um, you know, a couple elements to it is that, um, you know, the idea that a virus can can morph and then be novel and cause a pandemic is actually always present. And so I think that we need to understand it doesn't happen, but maybe once in a hundred years, but you know, the fact that we are, the global population is growing, the interactions between animals and humans and wildlife is actually increasing so that the, the issue about this virus jumping is still, if anything, is gonna be more likely moving forward. Um, and it is a, it, when it's a pandemic, it affects the entire world. So you really have to think about not only how you're going to try to manage the infection in Cincinnati, you have to think about how you're going to manage the virus throughout the entire world because it can continue to circulate if we don't deal with that. And that's going to be, I think, a, a, an ongoing challenge. Um, I think the other thing that um, – you know, we've had, quote, a number of scares in the recent past with MERS and SARS and Ebola, and they never really got to a global pandemic like this has been. Um, but I think as we think about other outbreaks of that, uh, understanding how we can, you know, identify them, work with the local communities to try to, in fact, contain and isolate those so that they don't become pandemics, regardless of where they pop up, is something that will be important as we think about in, in the future moving forward. I have two uh, defining moments of this pandemic, one on the UC Health side and one on the UC side. On the UC side, the day before classes started uh, in August, I walked through all of our college spaces just for that one final check. We had teams of, of college folks from every college and, and facilities and, and planning, design, and construction working for months to sticker up classrooms, move furniture, uh, make sure that everything was set for safety and health and, and social distancing and disinfecting workspaces. And walking through the campus that final time was just a moment of, 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 of pride and joy at how hard the UC team had worked. Uh, another proud moment on the UC health side 
was uh, when I saw that uh, outdoor testing, the drive-through testing tent set up right outside of my practice on Vernon Avenue. We were the first in the city, I believe, to, to, to do that. And the way that the UC Health team mobilized to meet the needs of the community was just incredible. Uh, question for you, what's been your proudest moment of the UC Health team during this pandemic? Um, it's no question that the, the, the proudest moment has been the individuals who have come together and, and have collaborated in a way that, in an unprecedented way, and in doing so has been able to truly move mountains. I think the other thing that I actually take great pride of is that the expertise in the leadership that's within UC really became as absolutely essential as we took care of the entire community something that really only this, this academic community could really kind of uh, really, uh, really deliver. And it's really been, I think, uh, a remarkable and uh, really a tremendous point of pride about how the organization has stood up and, and, and stood by this community. I would agree and, and echo that sentiment. Uh, you know, I, I sit on a couple of different COVID response teams and, you know, to see the clinicians working alongside the scientists, working alongside the community health folks, working alongside the public health folks, working alongside the teachers and administrators, it's just been a, a beauty to behold. Uh, we're, we're coming up on time, Dr. Lofgren. Any uh, Anything that we missed in terms of uh, things that you might have wanted to, to say to folks? Um, I know we had a lot of questions that teased your brain a little bit. Any, any final comments to the group here? Yeah, I think that, you know, um, I'm going to go back and, and, and get almost on a soapbox a little bit here. Um, that, you know, when the, when, the, when the virus was first introduced in this community, um, a couple of real challenges. One is we knew almost nothing about the virus. And quite honestly, here in Southwest Ohio, we were particularly hand-strung because we had almost no testing capacity. And so I think the things that we stood up really did make a difference. We now understand a lot more about what it is to keep this virus under control. Um, and if we do those things um, and are sensible about maintaining social distancing, washing your hands, and wearing a mask, um, you really can, we can live with this virus in our community uh, effectively and, and really protect our citizens. And it's a, it's a new way of, a new and different way of living, but we can, in fact, um, return to much of the normal, even a little good football game now and then. <laughs> if only we could win one with the Bengals, right? <laughs> Bearcats are doing all right. Those Bearcats look great. <laughs> They, they, they do. Uh, well, Dr. Lofgren, as a, as a lifelong Cincinnatian and as a, as a, uh, as a colleague and employee of, of UC Health and, and UC, I can't tell you enough how proud I am of, of your leadership, and it is an honor to work with you. Thank you very much for making time to, uh, to fill in our Alumni Society on everything that's happening. And uh, with that, we'll turn it over to Russell Best. And again, thank you for your time, sir. Thank you for inviting me. It's been great. Drs. Lofgren and Lewis, thank you uh, for this very informative program and for taking the time today to speak with us. This event is part of a new Bearcats Health virtual program series brought to you by the Alumni Association. Uh, in partnership with UC Health, our academic health centers, and uh, the other campus and community partners that we work with, we'll explore the COVID-19 pandemic, racial inequities in healthcare, uh, and resilience during times of stress and more. So keep an eye out for a post-event email here in the coming days with a recording of this program and a link to the Bearcat slash health website to learn more about our upcoming virtual health programs. We'd also like to share the Alumni Association's new online platform, Bearcats Connect, where you see alumni, students, faculty, and staff can network, mentor, and grow professionally. Uh, it is free to everyone in the UC family. Bearcats Connect efficiently enables its users to connect with alumni in particular fields, such as healthcare uh, and industries, engage with current students in search of career insight and connections, and find new work opportunities and career paths with the assistance of fellow Bearcats. Sign up for Bearcats Connect at alumniconnect.uc.edu. And lastly, this upcoming Saturday would have been homecoming, 
Uh, unfortunately, we are unable to host as regularly celebrated with our typical kickoff party, with reunions, the parade, and other game day festivities. However, we do have some virtual alternatives in the works. Keep an eye out in the month of October for ways that uh, we can celebrate the spirit of strength and unity that permeates the Bearcat family. Again, thank you to Drs. Lofgren and Lewis, and thank you to all of our participants for tuning in. This concludes today's program. Go Bearcats!